Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great privilege for me to be sharing the Word of God with you today, and uh, I certainly don't take it lightly. Appreciate the friendship, the partnership, but also this privilege we have together being involved in the kingdom of God and doing our best to keep the main thing the main thing, the main one the main thing. And uh, I do want to continue to do some of that this morning. I'm going to ask you, please, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I do want to just uh, read another text to, just to give a context and also to make sure we are keeping the main one the main thing. In Colossians, why are you turning to Acts chapter 1? Colossians chapter 1 actually says this, and I know you know this well, and you know I've re- shared this this weekend. Others have referenced it as well. But it says this in verse 13 of Colossians 1, For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and He has brought us into the kingdom, Amen. saved from, saved into, saved out of, saved into, transferred from one, transformed it, transferred into something else, rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and He has brought us into the kingdom of His Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in Him All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body. The church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything, not in most things, not in some things, but in everything, he might have supremacy, preeminence. What he's basically saying is that in everything, Jesus will have first place. And I think the church has been really good at finding a place for Jesus. And finding a prominent place for Jesus. But I'm not sure he has had first place, preeminence. And this season, God shifted his church and it's in a sense given us our head back. How many of you know that a body without a head is a corpse? And so we wondered why we're running around doing things and no power. No, it's because our head's been moved. But our head's back in place in a sense. And now we need to contend and keep on keeping on with the main one being the main thing. And everything else fits around that revelation. There are people in this room who've got great God causes, called of God, with stuff you're carrying from God. And if you want that to have value, if you want that to have significance, it's got to become linked to Christ, under Christ, in order for it to really have value here on earth. And so we have to not bring things next to Jesus. We've got to bring them under Christ. And when they're under Christ, that's where we're going to function in the fullness and the bigness of what God intended for us. Amen. So that's the desire of God. That's the desire of the Holy Spirit. That's our desire this morning. And this morning, I'm going to talk a little about the Holy Spirit, but in context of Jesus the head and our understanding of the role the Holy Spirit plays in this local church. And I realize that it's for some pretty weird. Uh, But I want to tell you, there's nothing weird about what God tells us about what He says about the Holy Spirit. And I'm not here, and and listen, we haven't got a lot of time, so here's what I want to challenge you is what I'm sharing, you've got to go make sure for yourself that it's in the Bible. That's that's your role. Our our role is to just stir us to go read, but go make sure what I'm saying is in the Bible. And also make sure what others have said that is contradicting to what I'm saying is in the Bible. Because I think often we look at what others, and we've been learned. I'm not judging hearts of any people here this morning. I'm ch- testing theology and saying, what does the Bible actually have to say about the Holy Spirit? All right? I know it's in our hearts. I hope it is. But I trust that's in your heart this, this morning. You know, Zechariah chapter 4, 6 says, it's not by might, nor by power, God says, but by my Spirit. What he was saying, it's not the might of your people. He was saying to King Cyrus, it's not going to be the might. How many people you have is not going to be what makes it matter. It's not by the 
your position as king, not by your power as king, but it's going to be by my spirit, says the Lord. I'm just going to say straight up, it seems that much of the church today is dominated more by the spirit of our age than it is by the spirit of Christ. (laughs) Quiet already. Well, not this church, every other church, all right? I'm joking, this church too. But... uh, but it does seem like we culture, and we're in this culture war, and we, we're running with the spirit of this age, thinking we're getting the job done. But we've been called to run with the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ must dominate who we are. It must take its place. I, I want to read you a, because I've seen this, I believe it, now statistics prove it. And I'm not a statistics guy, but as an American, even though I don't sound, I sound more American than he does, so I'm an American, and... <laughs> I don't live in South Africa, and I'm from Australia, which is another country, just so you know. It's not Australia, South Africa, but, but I, uh, I live here, and I love this nation, and I've seen, uh, it does seem that there's this weirdness or this, this like awkwardness about the spirit stuff that we almost are willing to just sideline that stuff and just go with what we're comfortable and, and I get it, but it's not biblical. God's not allowing His church to live like that anymore. God's bringing His church back to being dominated by the Spirit of Christ and functioning not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. And in the Christian Post in September 2021, so a few months ago, the title of this Christian Post said this, Most adult U.S. Christians don't believe the Holy Spirit is real. Troubling, I think, what a statement. A new study from the Arizona Christian University shows that of an estimated 176 million American adults who identify as Christians, just 6% or 15 million of them actually hold a biblical worldview. Conducted in February, they included a national survey included a national representative sample of 2,000 adults. The study shows that while a majority of Americans, self-identified Christians, believe that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and is the creator of the universe, more than half reject a number of biblical teaching and principles, including the existence of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? Now, I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming us for not bringing the true word of God. Uh, you know, I, I've said this. I said this this weekend if, uh, a couple of times that the greatest threat to the word of God is not those who outright reject it, but more those who claim to believe it but are ignorant to what it really says. And so I'm not here on a cause. I'm here to say, friends, we have a problem if we reject in the very existence of of the Holy Spirit. What future does the church have in this great nation? Now, can I also just say that if we think that the Holy Spirit is a blessing from God, then we get to reject the blessing if we don't want it. But I'm here to tell you He's not a blessing from God. He is God. Therefore, we don't have the right to say we don't want that stuff. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And many people believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but we live with this binatarian revelation, God the Father, God the Son, Spirit stuff, not sure. And now we see that most actually reject the existence of the Holy Spirit, and He's sidelined, and the church is functioning with great concepts, great thoughts, doing what the world's doing, and hoping we're getting the job done. And God says, I want to bring back my church to what I have to say. What will you do with God the Holy Spirit? 2 Corinthians 3.17, one of the most quoted texts. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He's not some concept, not some floating around ghost. He's God. Where the Lord is the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. When we yield to the Spirit as Lord, there is freedom. I'm here to challenge us again this morning. The Holy Spirit is existent. He's real. He's been here from, the, uh, from creation, before creation. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't fully understand the, 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 uh, the Trinity, and I'm not here to preach on it, but I think we need to be preaching on it if people don't think the Holy Spirit exists. 
But I, God, we don't believe in three gods. One God, three persons. The best way I can explain, and someone said this, if you, if you try to explain the, 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 the uh, Trinity, you lose your mind. But if you doubt the Trinity, you lose your soul. And the best way I can explain it is I'm one person, but I happen to be a son, I happen to be a husband, and I happen to be a father of these two sons in this room. So I'm a husband, a father, and a son, but I'm one person. I know that's not good enough, but that's the best I've got this morning, except to say God's not, a, the Holy Spirit's not an option. We, we get to choose, I guess, but He's not just a blessing from God, He's God, and we've got to come back to that revelation and make room for God the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like what, Jesus, what God planned for you, Jesus purchased for you, Amen. and the Holy Spirit personalizes it in you. It's the Spirit in us. That activates what God has done, what Jesus has done, and puts it in an everyday living, we see more of the Holy Spirit. And I hope you believe that, friends. We've got to come back to these truths. In Acts chapter 1, and uh, let's read there for a moment. The Bible, let me remind you, is the only book whose author is always present when we read it. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, After his suffering, speaking of Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. I love that. He didn't say go tell people. Go. He showed people he's alive. Amen. He convinced and proved that he's alive. I still believe that part of the church's responsibility, Christ our head, we the body, are called to go around convincing and proving to America and to the world that Jesus Christ is alive. Not a concept, not a thought, not a hope. Demonstrate he's alive today, alive and well, seated. We just read, rescued from the Son. He's not a wannabe God, a mini God. He is God. Amen. And he's alive. And Texas and Austin, with all your great, God bless Texas, and you're better at everything and bigger than everything. And yes, you are. But they need Jesus Amen. in this region and in this nation, in the nations of the world. And we've got to go about convincing. And proving he's alive. It says, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Rescued from dominion of darkness and brought us into his kingdom. He went about preaching the kingdom. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and dates that my father has set by his own authority. What he was saying is, none of your business. <laughs> don't get offended. He said to them, none of your business. Why? Because don't get caught up in the stuff you caught up at, at the expense of what you really called to do. And somehow the devil gets it right with us as God's people. We're so busy reading times and see. I'm not saying those things aren't important, but they're not as important as what Jesus said we're giving our lives to. So we're debating and dialogue, and Marco gets up here and reads Psalm 133. And listen, we all got opinions. I love this nation for many reasons. And one of them is that we have opinions in this nation about everything, and it's great. I love that. I'm an American too. Now I've got opinions about everything too, and it's great. And I want you to hear them. But today, it's not about our opinions, it's about what he said. And unity must come when we are coming together and realizing it's not this time and reading this season, trying to make this happen and get caught up in dialogue and debate that's taking us from what we're being called to. Jesus said, don't get caught up in that stuff, but you will receive power. Verse 7, it's not for you to know times and days for the Father set by His own authority. That's up to Him. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That word power is the Greek word dunamis. Now, I know you know this, but I want to bring it back to this because I want to talk just for a little while about what it means. What does a Spirit-filled church really look like? Not from some ideas that I have or concepts. I've been alive for nearly 50 years coming up in a few months. 50 years on this great planet. I know I look like I'm 23, but 50 is what I am. And I've grown up in ministry. I'm born into the church. I wasn't born again from birth, all right, but I was born into the church. My dad's been in ministry my whole life. Different denominations moving from, trying to find truth. But I've heard so many people for 50 years talk about a spirit-filled church, and it confuses me nonstop. 
And then I realized this concepts and ideas and experience, good, bad, and whatever experience, that has influenced people to preach what they preach. But how about we just go look in the Word of God and see how the early church was birthed and say, if that's what is important, then that has to be important today, given all our experiences together, right? I love the heart of this church. The leaders are brave enough to say, let's do what the Bible says. That's a brave statement in a nation and a world like today. And every church claims that, but very few run for that. I'm not blaming church. I'm saying let's be a church that's serious enough to say, if that's what God said the church should look like, well, then let's be that church and do what we can to represent Him today, not the early church, today church, with the things that mattered then. So we get this word dunamis, which is where we get our English word dynamite. You've heard that, right? And I, 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 talk, I hear so many of these weird people, with, they talk about the Holy Spirit, forgive me, they make it weird where I don't want to know about this stuff because it's so weird. And they talk about our job is to walk around with dynamite and blow it, and I'm saying this NSA, just so you know, spiritually blowing things up, right? And they walk around and we're going to blow this thing up. And we're gonna, that's not what he was saying. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to give you dynamite to mess it all up. That word dunamis has more to do with ability than blowing it up. And he said, you must wait to receive dunamis, power, ability, so you can be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The, you know, though Jesus had finished all his work here on earth, and he was ready to return to glory, he knew that these believers were not ready to go out into the world in their own power or their own strength. Do you hear that this morning, church? They were not ready to go in their own power and their own strength. We will never be ready to go in our own power and our own strength. He had already given them the authority, but now they needed power. And we love the authority we've been given in the name of Jesus. We get to walk around. But we, Jesus said authority was not enough. You need power as well. So you've been given authority, but you need to wait for the power. They would need a type of power that literally could transform them. They needed something more than authority. They needed power. This experience of the Holy Spirit is different from salvation. These people had already received the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus had breathed on them earlier. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now he's saying, wait till you receive power. And why I want to say that? Because this was more to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, now let me just say to you this morning, if you are born again in this room this morning, Regardless of your thinking of the Holy Spirit, you already have the Holy Spirit because He plays a major role in your salvation. You cannot be born again without the Holy Spirit. So you already, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer this morning, you can be this morning if you respond to what Jesus says to you today. However, if you are born again, you already have the Holy Spirit. So that's not in question. What we're questioning this morning is, does the Holy Spirit have you? And there's a big difference. And that's what Jesus was saying. You already received Him, but now wait for power where He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, and therefore you'll go and be witnesses. It's the identity. It's not a duty we put on once we're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the identity. You will be my witnesses, not do witness. It's the identity of for spiritful people are being witnesses, living a witness, being a witness wherever you go. Somehow we fly evangelists in to come teach us on how and stir us and make us feel bad because we're not seeing people saved. So we go do this duty for a season. But the Spirit in us forces us to be witnesses wherever we go. We are witnesses. Am I making sense? Thank you, sir. I believe every believer has the Holy Spirit. I really do. It's biblical. But I don't believe every believer. The Holy Spirit doesn't have every believer. And I'm asking this morning, does he have you? Baptism of the Spirit would deliver them to real power, dunamis, ability. And so here we see in Acts 2, so Jesus said to his disciples, you wait for the Spirit, he will come, and then you'll receive power and you'll go be. Acts chapter 2, here's the birthing of the early church. Interesting that the early church was birthed in power. It wasn't something they received when they were doing it. It was wait to be birthed in this power. And since then, we've all tried to get rid of the power and say we don't need power. 
or we're not comfortable with power, so let's not have power. And then we're like another social club trying to impact the world for Jesus. And also, here we see the identifying marks of a spirit-filled church. Acts chapter 2, let's read quickly. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like, now I love it's like, it wasn't a blow, it was, it's like Luke's trying to describe what happened. We so, let me step on your toes if I haven't yet. We're so caught up in how it has to happen that we get to miss what happened. I know people, and maybe you're one of them, and I'm just challenging your theology, not your heart. You don't need all this to happen every time. The book of Acts is not prescriptive. It doesn't mean it has to be like this every time. We don't walk around wearing those out things they used to wear. We, but when so many of us, like if it's not with what seems to be tongues of fire on your head, if it's not in declaring in funny languages, if that's not happening, well, then it's not the Holy Spirit. Well, then you're missing the Holy Spirit every time He shows up. Because he can and he does and he will, but he's not limited to what our experience is about or what we've read in Scripture. Well, I've got three sons. My two sons here and my youngest son's 15, Jude. And he, 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 listen, contrary to the prophets, I'm done with kids. Like, I've had three sons and, they, and the prophets say, oh, there's a daughter coming. I'm like, God, oh, it's going to have to be a spiritual one. And there's a daughter, because I'm good. So we knew that our youngest son, Jude, that, that was going to be our last child. Three boys. I'm just about broke. I'm old. I'm... I said, okay, Lord, this is my last son. So I said to my wife, Nicole, hey, babe, <clears throat> Jude, his first birthday. This is our last child. Let's bless him. Like it's our last child, let's bless him for his first, first birthday. So we bought him this great gift, and we wrapped up this gift, and we handed it to our first, his one-year-old. And Jude, my son, was in there. He started looking at the wrapping paper and ripping the wrapping paper, and he was enamored with the wrapping paper. He did not even care about a gift. Just so you who've got kids and they're turning one, just buy them reams of wrapping paper. Don't buy them a gift. They don't want a gift. They just want wrapping paper. So I was thinking, what a waste of money. What a waste of time. Just why did we do that? So he turned two the year later. I thought, well, let me just kind of downscale a little and wrap in paper and see what he does. And then the next year, he opened his gift and at least began to care what was inside. And I was like, oh, my boy, he's becoming a man. He's growing up. He's maturing. He now cares what's in the wrapping paper rather than about the wrapping paper. Are you listening? It's immaturity to get enamored with the wrapping that you're missing the gift. And I I know this is challenging because we so want to be prescriptive that we're missing the Spirit every time He reveals Himself. I want to say there are many more manifestations we see in the Bible, and there's more than what we can see in the Bible, but this is how we know whether it is Him who gets the glory. And let me go there for a moment. If man, a ministry, a song, a church gets the glory, it's no longer the Holy Spirit. He does not have a role to bring glory to anyone except for Jesus Christ. That's his job. He doesn't even take the glory. He shines the glory on Christ. In actual fact, Jesus said that I'm going to go, but I must wait for the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not been sent yet because Jesus had not yet been glorified. In other words, the Spirit couldn't have come into us until Christ was glorified because the Spirit's role is to bring glory to Jesus. So we cannot, is that God? We will know if it's God by who's getting the glory. And I'm telling you, too many people, gifts, anointings, preachers get the glory for what the Holy Spirit's doing. It's not the Holy Spirit. We've got to sort this out so we can have genuine, true, authentic spirit stuff that changes us, transforms us, and the nation around us. This church has been put here for such a time as this to walk in His power. But don't get enamored by gifts Come back to Christ and realize the Spirit of Christ needs to dominate again in this great church in our lives. Are you with me? (laughs) It says, what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, verse 3, came to rest on each one of them. It says, all of them. Please say all. All. American all. Y'all. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Not some. Not the chosen few in the front. Everyone in that room, man, woman, girl, boy, whoever was there was filled. This is not selective for certain people. We like to think it is because then we're more comfortable. I don't need it. You do. You're the preacher. All were filled. 
Jesus promised, and then the Spirit shows up, and all were then were filled. And their response was, they began to declare the praises of God in different languages. Jesus didn't say, when you receive power, you'll declare praises. They all declared praises because it's the natural response to the supernatural of what God called us to. You know, Philip Yancey, I'm sure you've heard of him. If you haven't, I'm not recommending him. But he said, uh, a society that denies the supernatural usually ends up elevating the natural to supernatural status. A society that does not acknowledge, denies that there's supernatural will take the natural and elevate it to supernatural. I want to tell you that happens in the church too. If we deny or we, we, res, we, we, we deny the existence of the Holy Spirit, like majority of Christians in America today from statistics, then we begin to elevate a gift or a church or a people. And we wonder why when shaking hits, it all falls down and people leave and get disappointed because we've had faith in the wrong thing. We've built around people and gifts rather than around Jesus and the supernatural. The Holy Spirit holds it all together. Through Christ and the Spirit in us is the one that helps us stay true to the call. Are you there, friends? Anyway, I'm running out of time, so please go read that whole text. And then read through the book of Acts, how the Holy Spirit ignited the church, moved the church. The early church was Spirit-filled, Spirit-moved, Spirit-led, and Spirit-sent. They went in step with the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit. There's infilling, refilling, and every other filling. It's not a one filling. It's many times we see the guys who are in that room were refilled and infilled. I know that's kind of maybe freaking some of us out. Read the Bible. Not what theologians say. Not your Bible teachers. Not those who've raised you up. Not the church. The Word of God. What does God say about God? So quickly. I'll give you the context. Peter stands up after all this. These, here's what happened. When the Spirit shows up and they were all empowered and baptized in the Spirit, they began to declare the praise of God in different languages. Everyone outside began to hear, gee, there's something going on here. Do you see that it wasn't just for the church? The church changed and everything else changed because the church changed. And everyone knew that something was different. And they, the best they could come up with, these guys are drunk. I mean, let's just go there. They drank. They must be high. They must be drunk. There's something different. That's what it must be. And Peter doesn't just leave it like that. We, that's where we go wrong. We, the church, just leave it. Oh, they must think we're drunk. Who cares what they think? God cares. They must know what's going on. And so Peter stands up and he says, brothers, let me just explain. You think, and then he says, listen carefully to me as I explain to you what's happening. We as the church need to get better at explaining. There are people that come to this church, maybe in this room this morning, who've been taught different. And the stuff's weird for you and we just pretend, get over yourself. No, no, let us explain. There's a backing for what's happening here. Tell the world what it is. They're not drunk. We're not drunk. And then he says, that, and then he begins to declare this prophecy that Joel prophesied. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And all men and women and all people, I'll pour out. And, and, and then he says, and all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please see the result of the outpouring. The result of the baptism is not so we walk around having good moments. It's always for the harvest, salvation, so people can call on the name of the Lord. Are you there, friends? It's not like, hey, we're full of power, but no one knows about it. Everyone knows. And there's got to be a backing. And I believe what God wants to do in this church more and more, there's stuff going to happen. But get up and show us publicly so all of us can walk comfortably. This is God, not man, manufacturing the nonsense we call Holy Spirit stuff in the church. We've got to fix it. Come back to truth, biblical backing. This was spoken of. This is what's happening. So what does a spirit-filled church look like? Well, I'm stating obvious things. I've got a few moments left. A spirit-filled church has, number one, His presence. Now, I, I was, I'm, I'm tempted always to preach on presence and power, but I want to separate the two because some are more enamored with the power that we neglect the presence. They're not the same thing. His presence, not presence. There's a presence in this room, in this church, but is it His presence? We're so good at the church as creating these awesome atmospheres, and I'm not anti them, but if they're not His presence, they're not helping. And I'm not against smoke machines and dark windows. and all. That's fine. Nothing wrong. We can do that. There's no way in the Bible says you can't. But we can't do that if that's the atmosphere that most people think, well, the Spirit's here. He's not, that's not the Spirit. That's the Spirit of our age. His Spirit. 
His presence is with us. That's what we want. Now, I know that all of us say, well, the Bible says His presence is with us always. Yes, His omnipresence. Yes, it does. And I know that. He's everywhere. We cannot escape from Him. And most of us are very comfortable with, well, God's everywhere. But the Bible also says He's not only omnipresence, His manifested presence is with us. In other words, He's everywhere, but He's also here. And we're not comfortable with the here. We like that He's everywhere. But when He's here, we've got to do something with here. But we need the here in order to be the people God's called us to be. We can't walk around saying we're followers of Jesus. It's the thing. And I think Mark this morning already talked about Exodus 33. I think it was you. uh, uh, um, um, Moses cried to the Lord. The Lord says, I've called you to do this, this, and that. He said, I'm not going anywhere if you're not going with me. He, He said it's your presence that distinguishes us from all other people. And it's also your presence that distinguishes us as your people. And we walk around saying we're followers of Jesus and we're the church. And we put on our thing that we know Christ and He knows us and nothing wrong with that. But the, 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 the thing should be that people see God's with us because He is with us. He's not just everywhere. He's here. Does that make sense? I, I said, and Marco recorded me already, but what would a church look like if it was more about attracting God than it is about attracting people. It would look very different to the church in our great nation because right now we do all the stuff that attracts people and we trust God's in it. What if we did everything to attract God and trust people come? Watch what happens then. (laughs) Okay, that's enough time. Move on. You're getting too tense. I'm trying not to. I've used this illustration. I was born, uh, I lived in Australia for many years, and I know you've got cattle ranches here and great meat. My goodness. Best meat in the world right here. Right here. No question. Uh, sorry if you're a vegetarian, you're in the wrong state. That's for sure. But, <laughs> but sorry if I offended some of you. I'm just joking. You can be all things. No causes here. But, um, but if you go to Australia, if you ever visited Australia, how many have been to Australia? I know it's hard to get in there right now, but it's, we're getting back. But if you go, most of the cities, the key city, all major cities are on the coast in, in Australia. And then you've got this open landmass space called the Outback. And most of the cattle ranches in Australia are in the Outback. And it's interesting, American ranchers go there and go, hey, man, why is it that you cattle ranchers have these endless miles of open space? Very few fences, but all your animals hang together. How do you do that? Because here we put up a lot of fences from what I heard. And the Australian... Uh, a rancher will tell you their job's not to put up fences. Their job is to dig for water. And wherever there's fresh water, the animals will come drink. They're not going to keep leaving and keep going. They can go and come back, but they don't have to keep them in by putting up fences or keep things out. They just dig for water, and when there's fresh water, those animals will find the water to drink. And I'm not saying we're animals, but I think it's a great picture of the church right now. If you just keep digging and bring in water, the living water, the presence of God, honestly, friends, you don't have to go far. God will bring people to drink. Amen. Fresh water, not... Yeah, okay. We actually need to take some of those things down, the fences that are holding the church in and keeping it. And let's just find some rhythm in God to reach people. But it's the presence of God. So yeah, oh, that's good truth, Tyrone. What about this morning? Did you come here even expecting to connect with the Lord? And it's not about our meeting, it's about our own time. But when we come together, it seems like people don't even have this desire or even thought that God could possibly be with us today. A spiritual church, God is with us. Out there and in Him. And God wants to show up and reveal Himself more and more. And when it comes to worship, guys, I mean, muse us, we love you, we love your art, we love your gifting. But when it comes to worship, it's the heart. God's looking at the heart, not the art of worship. We enamored by our musicians. God's not enamored by them. He's looking at the heart of people. Are we pursuing God? Or are we pursuing excellence that attracts people and God's not here? We've got to shift. What would this church look like if it was built to attract God, not just people? Maybe we need to shift our thinking. Secondly, His power. Early ch- a spiritual church has presence, or secondly, it has power. His power. You know, the early church, they lacked big budgets. I spend most of my time talking to pastors. It's kind of my job. And they're all like, geez, if we only had more money, we could get some stuff done. I get that. I understand that. It didn't seem to be an issue for the early church. Well, they must have had money. Well, then Peter and John lied. 
And I don't think they did, because they said, you know, in Acts chapter 3, silver and gold we do not have. And the dude's like, give me some money. Like, we don't have money. But that which I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Oh, if only we had the money they had. We need a big budget. Yes, we do need money, but the early church didn't have money. So money's not the thing. It's a thing, but not the thing. Well, if only we had the political approval and power that the early church had when they had the backing of their government and the backing of their secular leaders, right? Because that's what we think. Gee, the wrong guy in the, wrong, in the White House right now. I'm not getting political. If we get the right guy in the White House, then we can operate as the church. That's the thinking of most of us. You're wrong. I'm not mocking. You're wrong. Nowhere in the Bible can you see that. That's very old covenant at best, and you dig in deep to find that. And God used unsaved leaders to do His purposes. He directs their hearts like a water pipe. Just saying, yes, pray for your government and let's vote what we vote, but get what you get. And God's not sitting in heaven going, what the heck happened? And now White House and now I better find a new guy in. No, no, just, I know it's tough, Americans. I'm an American. I'm proud to be one. But just, if only we had what they had. No, no, look at what happened there. They got locked up in prison, shut down. They got beat up for doing what I'm doing right now. We've got a lot more political approval than the early church. Well, if only we had more people that had seminary degrees and greater understanding or two, a wise and un, un, unschooled, unwise, ordinary man. But one thing they did have that we still have today, power. They knew it. The early church had power. We still have power. What will you do with power? The worst thing you can do with power, please hear me, is pretend you haven't got it. And that's what we do. Mm, not sure about the power stuff. We don't have it. We do have it. Forgive me for saying this. There's more biblical backing, biblical, for strange fire than for no fire. In the New Testament, you cannot find no fire. Yet we're more comfortable with no fire because we're not comfortable with stuff we're not comfortable with called strange stuff. I'm not promoting strange fire, but I am saying we have no biblical backing for no fire in the church. From the birthing of the church to the outworking of the church. <laughs> Bible, not me. Hey, I, I, I didn't write the Bible. I'm just preaching it, right? He wrote it. I'm challenged by what I'm saying too. Don't worry. You know, uh, A.W. Tozzi said this. If God was to remove the Holy Spirit from the early church, 95% of what that early church was doing would stop and everybody would know the difference. He said, but if God was to remove the Holy Spirit from the church today, most of what the church is doing would carry on and most wouldn't even know the difference. I believe too many churches today do not preach the word with authority and power that Jesus promised to all of us. And the tragedy is that powerless churches end up using an human wisdom to see results. And the fruit of half-baked gospel produces half-baked Christians. That fall away from the first sign of trouble. Look at what's happened through COVID. How many people have fallen away? I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying half-baked. It's not enough to know truth. It's another thing to know the power. That we're, you know, people talk about, oh, well, we're a church, we're a spirit church, or we're a, 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 a Bible church. How do you separate an undividable truth? We have got into camps. We're more comfortable. I still get this question everywhere I go. Tyron, I know that the Bible says they both hand in hand and... But, but really, what do you think? And I'm like, here's the best answer. If you get on an airplane, which I'm about to do, and fly back to Denver this afternoon, what's more important on an airplane? A right wing or a left wing? <laughs> Until you can answer that for me, I don't have to answer this for you. We need both wings. A pilot's told me that. Literally, you need two wings, just so you know. That's, that's proof from a pilot. I have faith to get back to Denver to see my wife, but I'm not getting on a plane with one wing. Even in my faith, I'm not, we need two wings. You can sit here and say, I'm about the word. Well, then you're about a spirit. Someone said this, too much word, you dry up. Too much word, you blow, a spirit, you blow up. Word and spirit, you grow up. Amen. They work hand in hand. It's the spirit that teaches us the word and the word that reveals what's the spirit. They're not at war. They are hand in hand. So if you're serious about the word, you're serious about the spirit. And you who are all about the spirit, come back to the word. Keep it real. Keep it God. Keep it under Christ. Power for witnessing, power for signs and wonders. It's in there. The Bible, it's for us today. 
uh, uh, powerful prophecy, powerful deliverance, powerful healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, relational healing, all the healings that are needed in our nation right now. It's rampant in Austin, Texas. Been here a couple of days. This is a, me- a great place, but messed up. Sorry, it is. You got some weird people here. I'm not being dishonoring. They need healing. And if they're not going to get it through the church, where will they find it? Transforming power, power to transform cities, regions, nations. We call to not survive this culture. We call and empower to transform this culture. Motivational power. You know, people will leave family and friends and air conditioning buildings to cross the sea to spend their lives in service to others. When you're motivated by the Holy Spirit, we can stand up here and make people feel bad. The Spirit doesn't make us feel bad. He convicts us, and people will leave and go and do when it's the motivating power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to come back to. Thirdly, purity. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we've got to go there for a minute. When I talk about spiritual church, most people say, yeah, I want to be spiritual, manifestations, power. Yeah. What about purity? His purity, not our purity. A church that is spirit-filled has His purity. The Holy Spirit cannot save the world with a worldly church. And so we've been rescued from the power of darkness. I started this morning by reading that. But can I also say the Holy Spirit plays a major role in our holiness. If I, if I, if I can be straight with you this morning, some of us in this room are struggling with stuff, even sin perhaps. And we're doing our utmost to push it away and turn it away and say, God, it's not mine. But there's a spirit, the Holy Spirit, that comes and helps you deal with that. And if you're rejecting His existence, you're trying in your own strength to overcome flesh. Flesh can never overcome flesh. Hello? It says tongues, what seem to be tongues of fire. Not fire, but fire represents purity in in the Bible. The Spirit brings purity, helps us be a pure people. For too long, the church is chasing this Casper the friendly ghost rather than the fire of God to come and really do some stuff in us. And we all need that from time to time. You will never be holy without the Holy Spirit helping you live in the place of setting you free. When I yield to the Spirit, there is freedom. Are you, are you there? Major emphasis is on character transformation when the Spirit is leading us. It's not about manifestation at the expense of our character. The early church, the Corinthian church, we had manifestation after manifest. And Paul wrote to them and said, you've got this stuff going on, but your character, watch out. And the church never fulfilled what God had for them because they would not deal with character. You can't be spirit-filled if you are not living in purity. God wants to bring purity back to His church. Pure bride who's readying herself for the Son to return. The Spirit plays a major role in that. Don't try and do this on your own. You'll never do this without the Holy Spirit. Passion, nearly done, Marco. His passion, not passion, his passion. A spiritual church has his passion, not passion. I think we can all motivate each other and cheerlead, and then we've got flesh giving birth to flesh, and good flesh is still flesh. If you're a gifted preacher, you can stir people, and, and that's cool, but that's not what Jesus did. The Spirit doesn't stir us in the flesh. He Spirit gives birth to Spirit, and He gives us His passion. And we need His passion like never before. In actual fact, Paul writes Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk with wine that leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. It's abnormal for us who are believers not to have a desire for the supernatural. We have an appetite for the supernatural, and God wants to fill that. He creates it, and He wants to fill it. And we've got to get passionate about the things that matter to God. Now, this baptism of the Holy Spirit will make Jesus increasingly real to you. John 15. It will release power and boldness to witness, Acts chapter 1. He'll bring revelation, and the Bible will become more real and open up our eyes to see. The Spirit does that, friends. If you're just reading the Bible like a book, you need the Spirit to help you, and He does that when you're baptized in the Spirit. He will release a new prayer and praise language. It's in the Bible. Acts chapter 10, verse 46. Tongues. Oh, here we have to go there. Maybe for a minute, just so I can set you free. Now, I know that some of you like get the weird stuff, and I get it. I'm going to have to land in a moment because I'd like to pray for some of us. But, you know, tongues is, I know it's a weird thing. And it is weird because we're declaring something we don't know what we're declaring. 
So there's this great teaching that tongues is no longer existent, and, and I get it, but it's wrong. I'm just saying biblically it's wrong. Others are like, well, there's a gift of tongues. I understand there is this gift of tongues, but I'm not sure I have it. Yes, that's true. And the gift of tongues is there to edify and build others up. That's what Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. There is this gift, and if it's a gift of tongues, the gifts are always given to build others up. So if there's a gift, if someone has a gift of tongues and speaks it out, then we need an interpretation because it's for others, not for them. So I see that in the Bible. I don't believe everyone has that. I believe everyone can have that because it's how the Holy Spirit decides according to 1 Corinthians 12. But if you do speak in a tongue, it doesn't mean you now have that gift that you're the guy for that all the time. Just so you know, the Holy Spirit can do whatever He wants. I know I'm like bringing a whole lot of theology and theory, but I'm asking you to read the Bible. Not what you've been taught, what does God say? But there is another thing, the grace of tongues. As Jack Jack Hayford would say, it's the grace of tongues. The gift of tongues is one thing, but the grace of tongues is every believer gets to speak in tongues. Now you probably freaked out, and that's okay, the Bible. Why? Because speaking in a heavenly language is the way we get to edify and build ourselves up. Why would God give me this ability to build myself up and not you? That would be unfair. And so there are some who say, look, look, (laughs) my dad, and I've used this test me, it's the best I have, and it really makes the point. My dad was in a pretty legalistic denomination. Again, I'm not speaking bad about the people, but the rules, the regulations, and principles. And so my dad was, uh, was taught that tongues is not just weird and bad, like most of us think. It was of the devil. In actual fact, if you speak in tongues, you go to hell. Maybe you've been taught that, and I just want to tell you that's not in the Bible. I'm not judging your, your peop- the people who told you. I'm judging what they've said. Read the Bible for yourself. And so he was taught that if you speak in tongues, you go to hell. So one day, he was, thank God, he had a desire for truth, and he was reading the Bible by himself in his parish as a pastor in this denomination. And he was reading, dead read some of the stuff we just read this morning through the book of Acts, longing for what he was reading, saying, if only I could have some of that, I would love it. And in that moment, I don't know how to explain it to you. No one laid hands on him. No one else was in the room. No one taught him Honolulu and Suzuki and Shakaka and all these weird things we teach. No one was there. Just him crying out for something God had given in what he saw in the Bible. And he got filled with the Spirit, and he began to speak in tongues. Now, you've got to understand, friend, that's not weird. He's now headed for hell, according to his denomination. He phoned the moderator and said, we need, to t- we need to talk. So the moderator comes down and says, what's happened? He said, well, according to us, I'm going to hell. He said, well, how, what do you mean? He said, well, I was reading the book of Acts. Well, you shouldn't look at the book of Acts. Well, it's in the Bible, just so you know. <laughs> there is this thing of the book of Acts. Don't do it. Don't read it. Why not? It's the outworking of everything we believe. So he read, and he said, I was reading it, and I longed for what I saw, and in that moment, I was filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I spoke in tongues. Can you imagine the shock and horror of the moderator? So he looked at him, he said, Daddy, here's what we do. If you're willing to acknowledge you'll never do this again, and you'll sign an agreement, we'll pretend this didn't happen, and we'll just carry on. That's the best they could come up with. My dad said, sir, with all due respect, this is God did something that I will never turn off. This is a God thing, and I want to honor you as what you believe, but I want to honor God above all. And if this is God, how can I turn it off for the sake of honoring a denomination? And then he said, and by the way, why am I wearing this stuff? He had all the garb and the Batman and Robin outfit, he called it. And why he, I'm not mocking, all the man-made structures that make us feel holy that are so ungodly in Scripture. Why do I call me reverent? And why do they call me pastor? And he began questioning because suddenly the lights were turned on. The Spirit did something and ignited a reality, a new language, a new praise language, and he began to see truth for what it really is. Eventually we left because we were forced out because you can't have that stuff. 
Then we joined another denomination who they also said, yeah, that's fine. And then that stuff began to happen. And then they kicked us out. Not mocking. Eventually, my dad said, I don't want to be a denominational guy. I just want to be a Bible man. If it's in there, we do it. If it's not, we don't. And praise God, we found our way. And we're not perfect, but we have not a denomination, a word, a Bible that we all can go to and say, show me what you want to show me. And so I want to say to you this morning, you have the privilege, you can. You're not saved by speaking in tongues. It's not the only proof of being filled with the Holy Spirit, but it is something given by God to every individual who's a believer who gets to build up their own self in Him. It's a heavenly language. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't need a translation. It's not something you do publicly. It's something you get to do all your life. I've never had the problem with that because I was born, born into something that fought for something like that. But I know some of you maybe been taught wrong or haven't, and I'm just telling you, you can. You're not forced to. You get to. It's part of the package of salvation. Best I have is these shoes. And I know they're old shoes, but when I bought these shoes, I got the tongues with the shoes, right? No, I, I, I didn't say, hey, would you cut the tongue out? I don't like the tongue thing. I'm not mocking. It's, it's not. Look, this shoe fits because of the tongue. And I'm just telling you, if you're born again this morning, it comes with the package. You get to. Live in that if you want to. You don't have to, but you get to. And why wouldn't you want to? Like, Because how do you stay edified and built up if you don't have a heavenly language? All right, we have to land. Whew. Peace. It brings peace. His peace. Man, the world's lacking peace. Church lacks peace. Spiritful church has his peace. It says they were all together. Mark, I read 103, Psalm 103. Profound for this morning. There's so much in the context of local church and early church, unity, the spirit. There's a oneness, peace with God, peace with each other, peace with the world. We're not called to live like the world, but we're not at war with the world. And it seems the church thinks we are. It seems like we're at war with each other. You know, we all have a common enemy, and it's not each other. And so the spirit brings peace, peace with God. You'll have peace with others and we'll have peace with the world. We've got to come back to that. The Spirit brings peace. And His persuading, His convincing, His conviction. Probably a word lacking in the church today called conviction. We do as we see fit. We run with things we're comfortable with. But Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit a lot. And if you love Jesus, which we all claim to, then you want to hear what He has to say about the Holy Spirit. And in John 14, 15, and 60, he talks about the Holy Spirit a whole lot, the role of the Holy Spirit, why he's coming. And one of the things he said is the Holy Spirit will lead us and convince and convict people. He will persuade people. He will take things I've ta taught you, and he'll make them known to you. We need the Spirit to make things known to us again so we can stand with conviction again. Not someone's opinion. Not, I heard this in church. I'm convinced because the Spirit convicts us to stay true, to know what to say, to know what to do, to go where we're supposed to go. Friends, that's the Spirit's role. We need conviction. Paul was convinced to go here, uh, convinced by the Spirit, go in persecution and get beaten. I know this is what's laying for me, but I'm convicted by the Spirit. We need a, that in the church again. You know who brings that? The Holy Spirit. We have that, but we acknowledge that. Let's bow our heads together, please. Are you okay? You good? My friend still, good news for you is I'm leaving. <laughs> Just close your eyes for a moment, please. I'm not going to get weird here. I have to hand the meeting back. Remember this about the Holy Spirit. As you just close your eyes, the Spirit of God is holy. He's holy. We don't believe God's Word. The Spirit is grieved when we don't believe God's Word. The Spirit is grieved when we resist His leading. The Spirit is grieved when we refuse to change. The Spirit is grieved when we do not put His will above ours. The Spirit is grieved when He's not welcomed into our lives and meet it. Spirit is grieved when we're embarrassed about Him. Spirit is grieved when we criticize His servants and speak evil of them. The Holy Spirit is God. We do not boss Him around. The Holy Spirit uses us. We do not use Him. I need to learn from Him. He doesn't need to learn from me. He's not a theory course where all of our thoughts of Him cannot make up our lack of Him. He's the point of our teaching of Him. Instruction is useless without Him being the point. 
And I say this, when His presence comes, it's going to look like something. He does not come to divide, but He might, and it's not His fault. Cannot preach a powerful message, but live a conservative life. Lastly, we do not need the Holy Spirit to come again. So many people say we need another Pentecost. No, we don't. Pentecost happened. What we need is to acknowledge Pentecost happened. And the same Holy Spirit who came to the early church is the same Holy Spirit right here, right now. 